long way to go, but um, I feel now that if you if, if a person dies today and they get a what we would call by today's standard a good suspension, in other words, there wasn't a lot of ischemic time and you didn't have an autopsy and the team was right there at your bedside, your deathbed, to start the procedure, that even though there's going to be quite a bit of damage compared to how we'll do suspensions in the near future, still, if, if you stay frozen long enough, uh, they'll be able to repair that. And one of the things, of course, is simply a new idea takes time to be absorbed. So one of the factors is we've had some more time. We've had some more decades during which people have gotten used to the idea, seen the idea, whether it's in movies and film and newspaper coverage, and are beginning to say, okay, I've heard of that, I can understand it. We're also seeing a number of technological advances that make the whole concept plausible. So for example, we're seeing advances in nanotechnology, and now it's quite reasonable to talk about manipulation and control at the molecular and cellular level. So this, again, adds to the technical feasibility. Obviously, the whole notion of cryonics requires basically two stages. There's a stage where you cool, and then there's a stage where you apply advanced technology to reverse anything that might have gone, might have happened during the, the cooling process and restore the person to good health. Historically, cryonics began in 1962 with the publication of The Prospect of Immortality by Robert Ettinger, founder and the first president of the Cryonics Institute in Michigan. The Cryonics Institute was uh, founded in 1976, and for many years it grew very slowly. And for, me, for well, our first patient was my mother in 1977, and our second patient was my wife, my first wife, in 1978. And then after that, for quite a few years, didn't have any patients. Uh, now we have uh, 68, and uh, half of those have come in the last five years. And of our members, uh, I guess half have come in the last, uh, about the last seven years, something like that. So obviously we have uh, gained ground, and we're gaining it at an increasing rate. Uh, so we're we're still. We're still very small, obviously, in absolute terms, or in relative terms, if you consider the population of the country, let alone the world. We're still very small, but then we're still growing only very slowly, but nevertheless, the rate of growth is, increased, is improving. And, of course, the wind is at our backs, because every year, almost every day, the advances in technology make our position more credible. And, uh, barring unforeseen calamities, uh, uh, the future looks okay, except, of course, that there will be untold numbers of individuals who miss their chance. Uh, I would like to think of this as a, as a uh, <clears throat> extreme version of a hospital ward. Uh, we do call our, our uh, the people we have preserved patients. We think of them as patients, try to treat them as patients, metabolically challenged patients. Because when the Ted Williams case story came out, Alcor wasn't talking to anybody, understandably, as you know, when it first came out. Mm -hmm. So the next thing the media would do is contact us or ACS, you know, any cryonics organizations. And we got a lot of calls from sports stations and stuff like that. And, and a lot of people never even heard of it. They thought it was something brand new, and I was surprised at how few people actually heard about it. At the very first, be, before they actually froze somebody, when, when Robert Ettinger first wrote the book, The Prospect of Immortality, which kind of launched this, at the very first, when people didn't actually have to see a frozen body, before any, anybody was frozen, the idea of chronics was pretty well accepted, and uh, Robert Ettinger was, uh, invited on the Johnny Carson show twice. They had articles in Playboy magazine and and uh, this and that and everybody thought it was really great until they had to look at a frozen dead body and then they thought, wow, well this is bizarre. Rudy Hoffman, an independent certified financial planner, has helped more people sign up for cryonics than anyone. A reasonable backup, just like when we were, if those of us who were in the uh, 
information technology, if you're writing a long program or a long letter, a long document, imagine being 30 or 40 years in that document not hitting the save key. This is kind of a save key function. And again, not an end in itself, but a reasonable insurance. And of course, that insurance is in turn and funded by insurance. Uh, um, analogy of you know freezing a human body is like trying to warm up Hamburg or some of these other nonsensical uh, comparisons. That may have been true in the 60s when we didn't know as much as we do today about the molecular structure of the body. But today, with vitrification, that problem is largely eliminated. Brian Wook, senior scientist at 21st Century Medicine, has been working with Greg Fay to develop an advanced method of cryonics, a less destructive preservation method called vitrification. We do federally funded research in hypothermic preservation of uh, hearts, preservation of kidneys, and uh, cryothermic, that uh, means very low temperature preservation of human corneas. And we also do research on uh, cryothermic cryogenic temperature preservation, kidneys, cartilage, and uh, brain tissue for pharmaceutical research. Uh, in vitrification, uh, chemicals are added to the tissues and the organs, which allow them to be cooled to virtually any temperature without ice formation, even hundreds of degrees below zero. We believe that this company's technology may very well be critical to successful deployment of bioartificial organs and engineered tissues, it will be needed to treat an aging population at least until such time as aging itself can be successfully and comprehensively treated in vivo. Contributor to Wired Magazine and author of more than 40 fiction and nonfiction books, Charles Platt is the director of Suspended Animation, a company specializing in standby procedures for cryonics patients. We're not going to make any money doing this. There is no money to be made in cryonics. A very common misconception is that there must be a huge potential demand and a huge potential amount of money to be made. This is not true. It's very hard to sign people up and they never want to pay very much. And the service itself costs a lot of money if you're going to do remote standby. Very expensive. So the idea of suspended animation is to develop service in Florida and the rest of the nation do additional cases because you're no good if you don't do any cases. You don't find out all the things you should be doing. And I hope, personally, that if we set a good example here in terms of what can be done, other people may either want to do better than we are doing or they may want to imitate some of the things we are doing. And that's just fine. Have no proprietary feeling about any of the things we may create here. The more widely they are adopted, the safer that makes me as someone who wants to have those techniques for himself. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a cryonicist. I think that uh, it is something worth doing. Right now the uh, price for cryonics uh, at Alcor is $80,000 and this can be covered by life insurance. Uh, if you uh, start off very young, it will not cost you a lot of money. I'm paying only $85 for the uh, policy that uh, is sufficient to cover my chronic exp expenses. And uh, of course, it is not guaranteed to work, and uh, not everybody gets a high quality suspension. Uh, but uh, it is a wager that I'm personally willing to take uh, because at worst I'm losing $85 a year, uh, but uh, if everything goes well, I might uh, gain 100 years of life or more. <laughs>